Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Prashant, and I'm currently working at Nord as a compiler engineer. Uh, so I'm really sorry for spoiling your weekend today, but we'll make sure this presentation will make up for it. So also, I would like to thank Elvian Social Bangalore for inviting me to present a talk. So yeah, let's get started. So so the overview of the talk uh, will be will be uh, discussing about tensor. And then we will look at what tensor functions are and how these are represented in PyTorch framework. And then we'll move to the basics of MLIR and how do we transform uh, a PyTorch graph into a Torch MLIR graph. So basically an MLIR graph. And then we'll look at different passes uh, that a uh, raw uh, MLIR goes through. And we'll see the generation of TOSA, Lineage, and MHLO uh dialects or backends as in call in touch and so yeah so so let's get started with the key elements in machine learning so so the key elements in machine learning are tensor and tensor functions uh so tensors are multi-dimensional array that stores the input output and intermediate results of model executions whereas tensor functions are the computations that happen on tensors so, so this is our reference diagram uh, of what a simple neural network consists of. Uh, in this case, we have two tensor functions. So a linear tensor function and a real loop tensor function. So a linear layer performs a matrix multiplication with a input transpose weight. So this weight is actual learn learnable parameter that is associated with the, the linear operation, right? And this is again followed up by a ReLU operation, which is just an element-wise operation on the intermediate tensor, uh, storing zeros if the result is negative. So basically, it is doing an element-wise operation of max. Uh, it is comparing zero with x and uh, just outputting the max of what it has found. Okay. So I hope this slide is clear to everyone. And if we have questions, then we can stop over here. So yeah, so, so this is the same neural network referenced in the last slide, but it is written in the PyTorch module. So everything that is present in the slide is reproducible. You can run it and see that it will work. So, so it's a Python class, which consists of torch.nn.module as the base class. Uh, so the NN package defines a set of modules, which are roughly equivalent to neural network layers. So, so you can see over here this torch.nn.linear. So this is one neural network layer. And again, this is followed by torch.nn.redo, which is another neural network layer. So this NN package comes handy when you want to define set of layers in uh, PyTorch module. So, so a module basically receives inputs, uh, tensors, and computes output tensors, and may also hold internal, uh, internal state of uh, tensors uh, that is basically learnable parameters that we talked about in the previous slide. So over here, the weight is a learnable parameter, and and what we are trying to do is so the self dot linear actually contains a weight parameter, but we are explicit, explicitly saying that okay, we want the weight parameter to be a tensor of ones in this case, and so. So we define our neural network by subclassing NN module and initialize the neural network in the init function. And every NN module uh, implements an operation in the, of the, on the input data in the forward method. So you'll see that uh, it's basically self-linear is called on input and followed by a self-dot-relu uh, operation, which is nothing but these NN modules, right? So any questions over here? So what does the ten and sixteen mean? Are these dimensions? Uh... Okay. So 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 ten cross sixteen is basically the weight that is held by the linear uh, module. So the thing is that your input is two cross sixteen over here, and what the linear layer is doing is it's producing an output of two cross ten. So the and the linear does a transformation of x transpose comma y a w. So we'll, you will see that the W has to be uh, 10 cross 16 in this case to work that, right? Okay, got it. 
Thank you. So, yeah. So, so since the entry point to MLIR for PyTorch modules is the Torch script graph, hence we will take a look at how the Torch script graph IR is obtained and what it looks like. So, Torch script is a way to create serializable and optimizable uh, models from PyTorch code. And it has, so basically you can consider Torch script as an IR in itself. So I'll not go much details into TorScript IR. Uh, so, but uh, but how the script method actually works it is, first it will uh, so scripting in NN module by default uh, default will compile the forward method. So it will see the forward method in your NN module and recursively compile any methods, submodules, and functions called by forward method. So so it will go into self dot relu and see that self dot relu is again a torch dot nn dot uh, module it, it 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 basically belongs to a torch dot nn subclass so every torch dot nn subclass you'll find has a forward method so it will go into linear and see its forward method and compile it and similarly again it will go to self dot relu and go into its forward method and compile it so basically this is how the scripting works and you can see what all functions that are compiled uh, with this function over here and so let's see what what is what all are there so so this is the complete trace of all the forward functions traced by the script method so you can see here that the simple nn uh, calls the forward method of linear and relu so basically it calls the forward method of the linear and the relu functions uh, so linear in turn dispatches it and linear operation so so basically, ATEN is fundamentally a tensor library on top of which almost all Python and C++ interfaces in PyTorch are built. So it provides a, provides a core tensor class on which many hundreds of operations are defined. So, so, so basically, uh, so the dispatching of, and again, we'll see how the dispatching of ReLU is happening. So the dispatching of ReLU is a bit different since ReLU operation can have in-place semantics that is the input of relu will be overridden with the output of relu. So in this case, uh, we are in the simple NN module class. So the simple NN module class calls first calls the forward method of the linear function. So this is the forward method of the linear function. It will actually look for the weight attribute and the bias attribute and perform a atn dot linear operation over here. Similarly, after that, it uh, the relu will take the input of linear and then it will uh, dispatch this function. So what this function is doing is it is simply calling. Uh, it is simply calling. It it is actually seeing the boolean variable. So in this case, the boolean variable tends to be false, and it is calling function based on this boolean variable. So if the boolean variable is false, so let's look at this graph here. So if in place this boolean variable is false, then uh, I mean, if in place is true, then relu underscore will, will be called. Otherwise, relu will be called. So relu underscore uh, aten, if there is an underscore uh, uh, underscore present after the operation, that means that it has an in-place semantics. And in-place semantics is simply that your input will be over, input will also be, uh, will be overridden. So, so any questions over here? And here we are just trying to print the forward methods and nothing else. I mean, the class is not there. So forward method of every module that's present over there. So let's try to look at the core concepts of MLIR. Uh, now we want to transition to MLIR from Torch Script Graph. So we should try to look at what are the core concepts of MLIR. And then we'll uh, construct the entry point into Torch MLIR or how the torch MLIR graph actually looks like. So, so first we look at operation. So you can consider a operation as a, a tensor function. So a basically operation takes individual values as operands and it produces one or more SSA values as results. And the terminator operation actually says that, okay, it's the end of the basic block. So 
So that is a terminator op operation. So every basic block has a terminator operation. So and a block is basically a sequential sequential list of operations. So that that is executed in a sequential manner. So there is no control flow as associated within inside a block. And a region is basically a list of basic blocks. So and we'll try to look at what an operation looks like. And yeah. So so this is this is the anatomy of how an operation in MLIR looks like. So you see, percent rest is actually the name of the results, and there are actually two results produced by this operation. So colon two is uh, actually saying that okay, the number of value returned is actually two. The dialect prefix uh, specified that this operation, so the morph operation belongs to my dialect in this case. Arguments are nothing but operands to this operation. Uh, there are attributes associated with the operation. Then the dialect prefix. So uh, this is the type uh, of the operand. So this is uh, this is specifying that okay, this is a custom type, and the, uh, so the input is of my dialect custom type. So this is just specifying that, and since it is producing two other uh, results. And they are also my dialect other type and my dialect other type types. Similarly, uh, every operation has an associated location that specifies that uh, this is the source uh, from where this operation came from. So this is rich and mandatory, and it is present in every uh, I mean every level of IR in MLA. So let's move. So let's see how things are represented in uh, Torch dialect. So, so let's try to see this through Torch dialect IR. So the prim if operation represent. So this prim if operation actually represent uh, an if then else construct for conditionally executing two regions of code. That is the then and else block over here. So these are not blocks. These are regions actually. Uh, the operand to an if is basically a boolean. If the boolean is true, then then block will execute. Otherwise, the else block will execute. Now, this if operation uh, actually uh, very well defines how how the uh, operation blocks and regions are layered in MLIR. So, this if operation contains two regions, right? And each region con consists of a single basic block, and each basic block has a terminator. This yield operation is basically a terminator operate, uh, operation. And again, each basic block can, has, can have operations defined. And again, we can go inside it recursively. So again, there will be operation, basic block, regions, and, and it will go recursively. So this is how MLIR, I mean, the IR in MLIR looks like. So the semantics part. Any questions over here? So I have one question over here. Am I audible? Yeah, Hello. yeah, yeah. So right now this format is of Tor script, right? So this this format is not of Tor script. This is Torch MLIR. We are into Torch MLIR now. No, what I'm saying is previously you showed the graph. So if we want to map it, let's say if I created a PyTorch model in some mm -hmm. different format like .pth or something like that. So will it be compatible to MLIR? Yeah, it will be compatible to MLIR, but you have to define every. I mean, uh, currently Torch MLIR only supports Torch script, but you can also support different things. I mean, you can transform from any another dialect to MLIR. Uh, you you just have to define uh, how the rewrite passes will look like for that. Okay. So any other questions? So, so moving into uh, Torch MLIR. So there is a Torch MLIR dot compile API that actually takes an NN module, uh, the input to the NN module and outputs an MLIR module. So, so the output type can be set to different dialects. So you can directly output 
MHLO, TOSA, and Linaz dialect that we are talking about. But in this case, I am trying to uh, just output the raw. Uh, that is the IR, which is just the entry point in MLIR. So there are many other options in Compile API, like providing dynamic shapes, annotations, et cetera. And it can be found in this file. This is a very useful entry point. So to, to move from TorScript graph. So currently, it only supports TorScript graph. So, uh, so yeah. Any questions? So next, we'll try to take a look at how the uh, MLIR graph actually looks like. So, so, so this is this is how the MLIR graph looks like. So this slide just contains the different forward functions inside a module. So we can see the forward functions of linear, relu, and uh, so linear, relu, and simple and then present over here. So now, now let's try to look at uh, how, how things are being called from one module to another, right? So, so the root function that we were talking about over here is a simple nn dot forward method because, uh, because simple n is what we have defined and we are trying to move from here what, what is happening. So, so, so first we'll uh, take a look at simple nn forward and how things are being called from here. So, so it is somehow trying to get attribute relu and linear, which is nn modules, and trying to call the forward method of those nn modules. And we'll see in the next slide how they happen. So, so this is half the part of the IR, and the next part is basically present over here. So this unit, so let's focus on the bold parts over here. So this unit consists of three things, uh, a class function and nn module. So, so the nn module tries to bind the class attributes, one second. So, so the nn module tries to bind the class attribute uh, with the data that they hold. So, so in this case, you'll see that uh, there is uh, so class attribute training present over here, and nn module is binding that with false. So, so since our neural network only consists of inference graph, not the training graph, uh, so so that's why this is false. So basically, uh, so the class type actually consists of the attributes, and we, and the nn module consists of the values that should be assigned to these attributes, right? So similarly, uh, over here, there's a torch attribute linear present over here, and the linear is bound to percent one. The percent one is actually another torch NN module, and you will see that it will go on recursively from here, right? So, so any questions over here? I mean, th this is, I think so, I mean, important part, this slide. So. So yeah, so next, uh, I'll move on to next slides. So so the thing over here is that uh, this graph is not easy to manipulate. And if you want to do any kind of optimizations in this graph, it will be really hard to perform because there are classes, there are uh, there are many things over here. So, so let's try to take a look at a very simple optimization that we can perform over here. So, so if you see this relu forward operation, it is trying to call uh, torch dot nn dot functional dot relu method, and the and we know that in the compile time itself that uh, the boolean is false over here. So if you if you inline this function with this argument, what you will find that this torch dot n dot relu is actually called from this function. So so which can be directly uh, inlined over here, right? So so this is a very simple optimization and. These set of passes actually prepare for globalized object graph, globalized object graph, and canonicalizer and inliner actually actually tries to optimize the graph into a very simple function. So now, so so the globalized object graph passes. 
So this is the graph that is obtained by those set of passes. And we'll try to take a look at what happens over there. So, so globalized object passes uh, starts by finding the root module. In this case, it was a simple NN module, right? And recursively tries to inline all the forward methods of the NN modules present in the simple NN class. So it also creates global slots for all the parameters of the NN modules, which can be later inlined. So you can see over here that this is a global slot, linear weight and linear bias, which is present in the module, but it can be inlined over here, right? So, so any questions over here or the previous set of passes? So what does a canonicalizer do? So a canonicalizer actually performs various other uh, various optimization like constant propagation and all other stuff. So by canonicalizer, you mean that uh, I mean canonicalizer actually canonicalizes to a root form, which form that you want, right? So so there are many kinds of optimization over there. Like you can perform constant propagation, folding, etc. Does this answer your question? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So yeah, let's move on to next slides. So, so we want to inline the global slots and erase the module once everything is inlined into that function. So these are the set of the passes that does so. And you will see that once everything is inlined, you will just see one forward method in it with all the operations inlined into this uh, method. And this is very easy to see and optimize as well. So, so this is a graph obtained, which is much simpler. And, and this, is, this is the place where the in-place semantics is taken care of. So let's look into the in-place semantics and how Torch handles this. So, so, so there are two variants of ReLU which perform the uh, same operation, but they have different semantics. So, so the first one is uh, relu which which doesn't have in place semantics and another one is relu underscore which actually has an in place semantics that that means that it modifies the input tensor as well so so the torch reduce op variants pass so as the name specifies it reduces the op variants that it it reduces the uh, in place variant with the out of place variant so so in this case Let's see how the in-place variant is represented and why we don't want this, right? So, so first let's try to observe the different types of tensor here. So, so there are two different types of tensors. So first one is torch.tensor and torch.v tensor. So, so let's take a minute to understand what these are. So torch.tensor are mutable tensors and the non and follow non-value semantics, whereas Torch dot V tensors are immutable tensors and follow value semantics. So any questions over here? Now, now let's try to look at this specific operation over here. So, so this is this is the in-place variant of ReLU. So first what we what we did was we converted that in-place variant of ReLU to out of place variant because we don't want uh, different ops with dif uh, that are performing the same operation. So, but what is happening over here is it is trying to override the tensor contents. So what is outputted by this ReLU, that is, let's see, torch, uh, so percent 11 is basically outputted by this ReLU. And this is over, this particular V tensor actually overrides this percent seven, right? So now if you see the graph, uh, you might be tempted to think that uh, this is returning percent seven, so you can directly return percent seven from here. But and you you may dead code eliminate this part of the IR, but this is not the case, and 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 that's why we want to move to value semantics. So optimization is really easy in case of value semantics, and the IR is much more difficult to analyze and optimize in case of non-value semantics. So so that's why we want to remove uh, uh, non-value semantics as much as possible, right? Any questions over here? Uh, 
Um, I thought uh, mm -hmm. uh, MLIR uh, supports SSA semantics uh, by default. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. And SSA is basically value semantics, so that, that that's another reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with these set of next passes, uh, we are trying to remove the non-value semantics tensors, right, in the graph. And let's see the graph. So now every tensor present over here is a V tensor, right, and torch dot V tensor that is basically following the value semantics. Now. Now, uh, over here, you see that uh, the graph is actually incomplete. So, so a tensor should have a shape and a data type, right? Ele which is an elemental type. Uh, so in this case, you see that uh, the operand has that, but the result type is uh, not present. I mean, the whole, uh, the complete information about shape and data type is not present in the result type. Similarly, it and relu doesn't have anything over here. So what type of shape is basically propagated? And uh, seeing the semantics of linear and relu, we can determine in the compile time itself uh, that what the shapes will look like. And this is specifically handled by the shape propagation passes. So, so, so let's try to understand the shape propagation passes and how it happens. So, so this passes, uh, this pass actually leverages the already written shape functions in the upstream PyTorch. Uh, the self operand, so the self operand actually takes uh, takes input tensor shapes. So the input tensor shapes can be represented as a list of integers, and returns a list of integers. That is the output shape. So so we are taking example of ReLU and how the shape propagation passes actually work. So 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 the so the shape calculation of relu is pretty easy i mean it's just an element wise operation so whatever your input shape is will be the output shape right so so this is basically a unary function which is defined in the upstream but we are trying to leverage them in the downstream to torch and lidar these functions so what we try to do is first we try to jit uh, script this function eight and relu and we try to just import this function in MLIR. So, so this is how this function will look like. So this is get and relu, and this is calling the unary function over here. So this is how the function will look like. And now let's try to look at how the shape cal. So any questions over here? I mean, Yeah. So, so the to, so the torch dot shape dot calculate op calculates the shape for the set of values that is yielded by the body region. So it has two regions: the shape calculation and the body region. So so this is the shape calculation region, and this is the body region, right? Uh, so so first the shape calculation happens, right? And it calculates the shapes for the output of what's there at the body region. So uh, what is outputted by the body region and then embeds that output. So we'll look at the later passes, how it happens. So, so in the shape calculate region, uh, what we are seeing that it is actually calling the shape calculation of relu, which is this function. And this function in turn calls uh, this shape function unary, which is actually upstream function, but we have converted it to MLIR and stubbed it over here. So, right. So any questions over here? So, uh, so are there any shape propagation mm -hmm. passes in uh, MLIR in the, in the sense that you are using an upstream function that, uh, uh, that does this? Uh, is there a pass that's in MLIR that uh, does the yeah. same? Yeah, yeah. In Torch MLIR or uh, specifically, in, uh, you are talking about MLIR as a whole. Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, MLIR so, uh, so, uh, already has these uh, yeah. these member of types, right? Uh, so uh, and it has uh, arbitrary shapes, and uh, I guess it uh, already has a built-in shape propagation operation, right? 
yeah yeah so so uh, so it differs i mean you need to calculate the shape of what an op calculate so it is basically uh, transparent to that op and opaque to mlir i guess so right so uh, okay mm -hmm. so yeah so so first what will happen is first the shape will be calculated for the linear operation so in this case this is the linear operation and it will be propagated downwards to uh, relu so basically this is uh, forward data flow analysis uh, of the of the shape calculation and propagation so next look at next slides so in this case uh, you have so in the calculate region what we are trying to do is we are trying to calculate the uh, uh, we are first we are taking the eight and size of which is nothing but it is taking the size uh, i mean it is it is actually taking the operand from uh, what is calculated by linear and then it is propagating it downwards over here to to this op now this op will sim uh, simply extract out the shape of what is uh, given by outputted by linear op and then it will be uh, calculated via and this this particular so it will give a list of uh, integers which are shapes of that function and this will be uh, sent to this function which will determine what 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 are the output of relu shape looks like so and and similarly inlining and so all the shapes that are over here are constant so if you perform inlining of operations you will find that uh, you will be able to determine the output result shape in the compiled time itself so so yeah this is how the shape is calculated and then what we want to do is we want to drop all this shape calculate ops over here we just want to want simple relu and uh, we just want simple ops over here so this is what drop shape calculations do so uh, so basically it drops everything that is torch or shape dot calculate from here and simply gives you a nice simple ir now let's try to look uh, further analyze this ir so if you if you look at these uh, these unknown so these are basically present so basically the shape has been calculated but the elemental types have not been propagated uh, so we, we uh, so the next set of passes uh, actually take care of that so in this case there is torch refined types and torch refined public return which actually so the first refined types actually moves through all the eight and ops and determine the output result shapes in a forward data flow manner and then it tries to uh, uh, modify the shape of the entire function so which is uh, actually done by torch refined public return pass so let's try to look, uh, take a look at that so so now after after these passes you will find that okay this this ir is in a pretty good state and we have all the shape and uh, elemental types information preserved over here right so any any questions up to this, up to this point yeah so let let's move on to next so so what you see over here is a torch eight and linear operation now this operation is basically a mat a transpose followed by a mat mill so so in the very first slide we uh, we mentioned that so so linear is basically input transpose times the weight and and we can actually break so we can actually break this linear operation into a uh, another set of eight and linear eight and operations that are uh, that is basically uh, transpose followed by a mapwell and this is specifically uh, obtained by the decompose complex ops pass so what it does it so it decomposes bigger pytorch chops so coarse grained pytorch chops into fine grained pytorch chops so so that this is the pass that does so so what is what it is doing is it is first uh, doing a transpose and followed by a matmel operation right so any questions up to this point
So now let's try to look at, so after this decomposed complex of pass, we are good to go. I mean, we can generate different backends. And so, so basically Torch and Liar supports rich set of backends or dialect, which, which are generally MHLO, TOSA, and LIN, and uh, which can be generated with, uh, with a torch, uh, with a torch MLIR passes. So, so this is the MHLO dialect and how it looks like. It it has the same level of abstraction as uh, as a torch dialect. Similarly, the TOSA dialect has also the same level of abstraction. And and this is the uh, Linalge dialect and how it looks like. So 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 these are the different backend conversions that you can do in torch once you obtain a torch graph. So any questions up to this point? Um, so why do we specify different uh, architectures like CPUs or GPUs or uh, even TPUs? Uh, could could you speak more loudly? I'm not able to hear. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 why do we specify which architectures uh, to code gen for? Uh, uh, so are we at the code gen phase? So no, we are not at the code gen phase right now. Okay. Yeah. So, so currently we are even at lineage on tensors phase. So tensor doesn't have a memory abstraction, right? So, uh, so yeah, we are not at the code gen phase right now. So these are actually the front end IRs, right? Which are mapped with the uh, back end LLVM kind of IRs, right? Uh, these, uh, by these you mean MHLO, TOSA and lineage, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so basically these are the upstream uh, MLIR IR that is used by the whole community. And once you are, let's say in TOSA, you can move to different level of IRs very easily. In fact, in LLVM IR also. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, so after these slides, I have questions only. So and. Uh, I think so. We have Anish and Gaurav present over here. So you can ask questions from them or we can discuss over here. So what questions? Uh, can you explain more about IRE? Okay. Uh, is, so that's the back end, right? Uh, for uh, uh, talkscript.nem. So, so I can give you a very uh, abstract picture of what IRE does, but uh, I still don't know how, how it perform different set of passes. There are thousands of passes that it goes through. So uh, so the thing is that it takes, let's say, it, it takes, actually it takes all the three level of IR. So in this case, MHLO, TOSA, and then and So you can give input uh, to IRE these IRs. And what it will do is you have to specify that which for which device you want to code gen to. So let's say you want to code gen into CPU. So you specify that and it will go through a set of passes for CPU and uh, and there are many passes. I mean, for, from many passes, there are optimization passes like tiling, uh, et cetera. And after that, it, uh, it determines uh, optimal graph and it IDE also has a runtime abstraction also where you can run these IRs. And, so, so in a brief picture, but yeah, we can discuss about IRE more offline or something, right? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I think to understand, so uh, after Linal on tenses or uh, TOSA or uh, MLHO, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so where all this happens uh, in the sense that, um, you mentioned IRE, so IRE is uh, one place where you can lower all these dialects into, um, you know, uh, uh, LVMIR or any backend that you want, NVMIR or um, even mm -hmm. uh, uh, x86 or something like that. But uh, yeah, uh, so I'm not sure how how all these two fit in with PyTorch, right? So, uh, so 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 think of PyTorch as I mean Torch and LIR as just a uh, just a front end conversion. So, IRE, let's say that IRE does the code gen for you, and uh, Torch MLIR takes the input as a Torch MLIR uh, Torch module, 
and it converts and gives you uh, gives you uh, MLIR functions that can be inputted into AD for later code change. So, so it's it's just a front end conversion kind of thing. You can think of uh, Torch MLIR as a front end conversion. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, user guide is kind of a thing like if we want to add uh, new passes or we want to support uh, new formats also for the PyTorch? Okay, for uh, for in Torch and Liar, right? So so yeah, I yeah. think so there is there is contributions can be, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I can I can I can send a I mean. Uh, list of things that you can uh, I'll uh, so we can take this offline and I'll send you a list of things that uh, that's useful for first time contributors contributors okay thank you that would be good Hey, uh, can you also talk about FPL? Uh, you have time. Uh, so, so FPL is basically speeding up polyhedral compilation. So, it, so, so let's talk about polyhedral compilation. So, what happens over there is so FPL is basically a trans precision way to support polyhedral compilation. So, let's say that uh, you are trying to do a polyhedral compilation. Uh, I mean, you, you want to structure the for loops as a polyhedral compilation, right? Uh, so what you are actually going to calculate polyhedra, then perform union operation and all other stuff, right? So so rather than so so these for loops are really small and they have a uh, I mean these are basically 3D or 4D, they have a 3D or 4D iteration space. So so the thing is, uh, what FPL does uniquely unique is it tries to start from, uh, let's say, integer 16, and then perform those union operation. And if if uh, if the value is not supported with int 16, then it tries to go back and then again tries to uh, increase the precision, let's say int 32, and then tries to perform the polyhedral compi compilation, and then move back and forth. So this way, uh, it's actually seen in the graph that most of the polyhedral compilation, that is real world program, can be can be performed in uh, int 16 thing. So rather than uh, taking a generic int 64 and doing this, you, you can do this way, right? So 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 that is basically. But there are more. I mean, uh, and. And there are lots of upstream contribu contributions over there. Okay. So I hope you I hope you get a general picture of what's there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is more of a backend for uh, Affine. So from Affine uh, dialog, you go to FPL and uh, do all the calculations and come back and say this, uh, or um, oh. FPL would give you a list of transformations. So, 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 yeah, exactly. So, uh, from a fine dialect, you want to. Uh, so, what FPL does it? It takes a, let's say, a fine loop nest and it will modify the loop nest with some kind of tiling and all of the stuff, what, what you specify over there. And it also checks the dependency and all this stuff. And, and it gives you a, let's say, an, but it's not at that stage, but let's say it gives you an optimized tiled version of uh, those loop nest. So, so yeah, so uh, FPL is basically uh, a library to perform uh, loop nest optimizations and all this stuff. And, and those loop nests have to be affine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. 